neurons still needed to absorb this uh, information. So yeah, we, we're going to go on to capacitor. Uh, who's using capacitor? Do you, oh, a good uh, two thirds of the audience or so. So the way I understand capacitor uh, is from when I go, go to these um, events and I'm standing at the booth and I always get the question is, can capacitor do this? And the thing has taught me well, he goes, of course it can. And now to tell us how to do that, over to Nathaniel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. That's just what I needed. Okay. <laughs> Great. So I'm Nathaniel. Um, happy to be here in London. And I've been with Influx coming up, well, I'm almost to my three year mark here in August. And I've been working on Capacitor. And recently I've also been doing some work on Flux, the new language and engine. So today, as Mark mentioned, I'm going to tell you everything about Capacitor. And actually, I'm going to stay pretty high level, um, and I'm going to focus on <coughs> several use cases of Capacitor. Specifically, well, I'm just going to go through six use cases and walk through it. And the idea is to show you the breadth that Capacitor can do. And my hope is that as you're seeing these use cases and I walk through them, that you'll see, oh, okay, that's similar to a problem I'm trying to solve. And then you can kind of start with where I've started and kind of go from there. So it's kind of like a jumping off point for capacitor. And, and then the idea, like I said, is stay pretty high level. I'm not going to put any text script on the slides. Um, we're just going to talk about stuff. Um, but if you do want to follow with the details as I go through, I actually have a GitHub repo up that has all the text script for the things I'm talking about. And I'll have a link up for that in just a second. OK, so, so Mark already asked you guys um, how many of you are using capacitor. But I can see that show of hands again. Real quick. Great, awesome. And then, and then of those using capacitor, how many are you using it for like alerting type workload? Okay, so many of the same hands. Is my mic not on? Okay, I was wondering about that. <laughs> okay, is that better? Hello, hello? Not hearing. Okay, it's good now? Okay, can't tell up here because speakers are that way. Okay, great. Okay, now I can hear that. Wonderful. Hello. Okay, okay, starting over. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nathaniel. Um, so, okay, so I was just asking who's using capacitor, bunch of hands, and then specifically for, for alerting, who's using capacitor for something besides alerting? Some kind of batch processing, other kind of workloads. Okay, a handful of you guys. Awesome. So today we're going to kind of talk about kind of the breadth that capacitor can do, because um, most time people focus on the alerting, and yeah, it's great. It can do a lot there, but it can do a lot more as well. And then to kind of just preface this, everything that capacitor can do, flux can do as well, um, or, or will be able to do, right? So not that it's built that way yet, it's, it's still kind of an in-progress thing there, but that, that's kind of the idea is flux represents the unification of both what the database can do and what capacitor can do. So kind of keep that in mind as, as we're going through that today. Oop, now my clicker's not working. I can shine it at people. Okay, whatever, I don't need a clicker. Now my laptop is frozen. Maybe I just needed focus over there. Okay, that's all it was. Okay, great. Okay, so introduction to capacitor, walk through how to install it, and then we'll explore some use cases. So capacitor is kind of the action layer, I like to call it. So InfluxDB stores your data. Chronograph lets you look at your data and visualize it and, and inspect your data. And Telegraph allows you to collect your data but capacitor is what allows you to make use of your data, do something with it, take action on it, and, uh, and interact with third parties. So most of the, so Telegraph has tons of plugins to interact for collection data. Capacitor has a handful of plugins to be able to push your data to other systems and or alerting and these kinds of things. So that's what capacitor does. And it runs as a separate process. So where it fits in the tick stack is it's, as its own process among those four. And, and so it kind of acts as kind of like a pseudo query engine for the database but it, it allows you to do a little bit more. Okay, so I'll walk you real quick through the steps of installation. Not expecting you to do this right now, just trying to show you it's quick and easy to get up and running with Capacitor, just like it is the rest of the tick stack. So just download the appropriate binary um, for your distribution. Here I've got Ubuntu as an example, and then simply run the Capacitor daemon. Um, if you do install the packages, we do include the systemd service unit scripts so that you can, you know, pseudo service, or system CTL status or start whatever on capacitor. And that way you can manage it through system D. And then an example of spinning up a task in capacitor, capacitor runs tasks. It's essentially a query, except it's, it's up in the background and you can turn them on and off as you go. And so you, like a, an example command to define a task, 
you'd say capacitor define my task, and then you'd give it a path to a tick script that has all the data in there about how to run that task. And there's a whole tutorial online in our docs about how to get started. Okay, so before I jump into the use cases, I want to talk about the way capacitor sees your data, how it's thinking about the data, and in turn, how you can think about the data when you're writing tick script. And um, so this is a programming model that's, that's called flow-based programming, or flow programming. Uh, I'll use those probably interchangeably today as I talk. And the idea is that you have a graph or a, or a tree. You've got a bunch of nodes, and you've got a bunch of edges. And the nodes represent something you're going to do to the data, and the edges represent where data flows. And so that's all flow-based programming means, is you orient the way you think about and the way you model your data um, in this flow of data from operation, edge, next operation, edge, next operation. So you'll have some source of data, and then you'll do something with that data. So maybe you'll window the data. And then maybe next you'll take the mean of each of those windows, and then that's all you wanted, so that's the result you'd return to the client or do something else with. Um, but each of these nodes is seen as a black box in flow-based programming, meaning that the window node isn't doing anything special that the mean node is doing. So you could like switch these two, and you'd get a different answer because you're doing a different computation at that point, but the order in which you connect your nodes together is, is I mean, it has meaning for what you're doing, but you can connect them in any order that you want. So that's kind of the idea behind flow-based uh, programming. And then the edges themselves, um, they represent the data flowing, and the way capacitor thinks of the data is the same way the database thinks of the data, which is points. And every point has a set of fields, a set of tags, and a timestamp. And so as the data flows along the edges of, a, of the execution graph and capacitor, um, that's what it's seeing, is those points with those fields and tags. And yeah, so that's how capacitor thinks about the data. And that'll come up a couple times as we go throughout this talk today. Okay, so let's jump into some of these use cases. So like I said, we're gonna talk about six use cases. Uh, a pre-processing use case, a post-processing use case. These are typically like your ETL jobs, extract, transform, and load. Um, you can use capacitors, kind of your ETL engine, if you will. Um, let's talk specifically about one kind of alert where we want to alert on a relative change. What I mean by that is you want to alert, similar to um, Steve from CDC's talk earlier, he had uh, the graph and then he had the baseline in the background. And you want to alert on a significant deviation between those two lines, the, base, the baseline and the current. So we'll, we'll walk through how you could do that with capacitor. Um, we'll walk through how you can use capacitor as a hot cache or a materialized view is typically how it's called in other relational databases. Um, talk about how you can auto scale your services. So if you're using um, Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, or AWS, um, capacitor can actually talk to those APIs and auto scale your services for you based on the, any logic you have. Um, and then we'll also talk about how to forecast on time series. Um, and uh, our previous talk from Danlon make sure I got that right, and then <laughs> um, was great. And so you could take any of those algorithms that he talked about earlier and kind of plug them into the forecasting bits here, and we'll, I'll show you how you can do that. So um, it's been here on the screen, but I'll give people a second as well. If you wanted to follow along with some of the tick script um, that I'll be referring to for these use cases, just go to this uh, GitHub URL. Um, it's not very big, so if you don't want to pull out your laptop and set it on your lap, pull it out on your phone, it's still pretty easy to read. They're still pretty small scripts. Um, and yeah, and just kind of follow along if you, if you want to kind of get some of the extra details that I didn't want to blast on the screen because no one wants to really read code on a PowerPoint. So here we are. So I'll give people just a, just a second longer to, to pull that up if they're, if they're interested. Um, okay. And then if anyone's having issues, because maybe I typoed that, I don't think so, but <laughs> if anyone's having issues, just scream out now and then we can solve it. Good. I'm gonna take a drink real quick. Okay, let's moving on. So let's talk about our pre-process uh, ETL job that you could run with capacitor. So this is the architecture in which you could run capacitor for a pre-processing job. We're calling it pre-processing because capacitor is sitting before or in front of the database. So the idea here is Telegraph or whatever agent, agent you're using to collect your data sends its data directly to capacitor instead of sending it to the database first. This is one configuration in which you can run capacitor. Um, and we'll talk about others in a second. But in this use case, what is use 
how it's used is you take your data and you pre-process it in some way because either the data you're bringing in is not really worth saving in the database until you pre-process it, or you have so much of it that you only care about a small subset of it that you only care to store that little bit. And so you have capacitor pick that out first and then store it. So the example tick script that I have on, on that repo is a simple tick script that grabs the disk usage data that Telegraph would output, and then it checks if the path for the disk usage starts with slash dev slash mapper. And if it does, then it just assumes that that's redundant because it's a mapped disk. I mean, it's not necessarily a great assumption, but it's an example. It assumes it's a mapped disk, and it would just drop that data and only let the actual raw like SATA drives come through. So as a simple example of some pre-processing data. Um, another example, um, we actually do this um, in a system that we're using right now. Uh, we put capacitor in front of the database internally, and we have it filter out our tracing data. So we're using open tracing to trace um, spans and, and requests through our, a new system that we're building, uh, specifically around Flux. And we have all these traces, and we're sampling tons and tons of traces, and we don't want to keep all of them. And so, but they come in as different events, because one span from one server will hit, and then another span from another server will hit. And so if we just pick them at random, we would not get a continuous view of the traces. We would we'd get half of the traces for half of the spans for one trace, half of the spans for another, or, or some fraction. So what we do is we send all of the traces to capacitor, and the capacitor just uses a consistent hashing mechanism to determine whether or not it should keep the trace based on some sample size. And then it takes only those traces and sends them to the database. And what that does is it allows us to get a really consistent view of all, so like if a trace hits, you know, the gateway, and then it goes through Nginx, and then it hits our flux process, and then it hits the database, and then it comes back out. Each one of those will make an independent request to Capacitor saying, here's my trace, and then Capacitor will go, oh, okay, all of those traces are ones I'm gonna keep, and it will store them in the database. So you get a consistent view of all of those. So that's a real world example of where we're using pre-processing with Capacitor. Now, there's one um, caveat to using Capacitor in front of your database, and you need to be aware of this, which is that Capacitor stores no state. So if capacitor needs to be restarted for whatever reason or it crashes, you lose all of its state about the jobs it's running. It doesn't forget about the task it's supposed to run, but it forgets any state about the running of those tasks. So if capacitor were to crash, in our traces example, we would lose those traces. But since we're dropping about 90% of our traces anyways, we don't care um, in this particular case if we drop a few traces while we have to do a restart or a reload from a crash. Plus we're running multiple capacitors, so each capacitor is only handling a small fraction of the traffic anyways so we only lose at most that small fraction. But that's something to understand when you put capacitor in front of your database, is that it doesn't store any state, and you're putting it as a gateway to actually persisting that data on any kind of disk. Okay, so the next um, capacitor use case is post-processing ETO. And what do you know? The data capacitor sits behind the database. Amazing. So the idea here is you can do the same kind of workloads that you would do with pre-processing, except you land the data in InfluxDB first, just so that you can persist it. And then you have capacitor read it back out, do whatever it needed to do to that data set, and then write it back into the database. So that kind of has this circular relationship between capacitor and the database. This has the advantage of that you guarantee that your data lands on InfluxDB in the database and is persisted right from the collection. And you don't have to worry about it from um, you know, a capacitor availability perspective. Because if, in this case, if capacitor needs to be restarted or it, was, or it crashed, you could simply boot it up again and tell it to just replay the data from the past because the data is stored in InfluxDB. Um, the example that I have for this one is a simple like continuous query downsampling query. Um, it simply goes into the database, it queries the data, computes the mean, and then writes the answer back in. And so you can use Capacitor as an external continuous query engine for your database. This allows you to manage your continuous queries a little more directly, get visibility into their state, because Capacitor lets you visu get visibility into the amount of data that's being processed through each task, and it gives you a little more visibility, plus it offloads the work from the database itself and puts it on Capacitor as you need it. So it's kind of like that first step towards scaling the read tier versus the write tier independently. Um, in addition uh, to querying the data here with continuous queries, you, you just get one query. But with Capacitor, again with flow-based programming, because everything is just a black box, you can just chain as many queries as you like together, and you can build really complex queries. So if you have currently a chain of continuous queries that write into continuous queries that write into continuous queries, 
please rewrite that as a single capacitor task so that you can manage it in, in just a single place. And then one other note here is if you do have a lot of data that you, that you need to downsample or pre-process, in this post-processing world, you could set where that data lands to a really short retention policy, say like a day. And that data, all the raw data lands, it's persisted for a day, that gives capacitor 24 hours per point to actually pull the data out, do whatever it needs to do to it, and then write it back in. And that way, your clean downsample data, you can persist for a much longer retention policy, but that raw data, you can persist for a shorter retention policy. So if you didn't actually care about that data much beyond just getting it to land in the database, that's another option that you can use. Okay, so we've talked about capacitor as an ETL framework um, and being able to you know, extract and transform your data and then load it back into the database. Um, and anything that we're gonna talk about next could be one of the transformations that you do with capacitor. So let's talk about alerting real quick. My mouth gets dry, so I'm gonna drink. Okay, so most of you that raised your hand saying you're using capacitor said you're using it for alerting. So that's great. We're gonna kind of dive deep into a more complex alert, if you will, um, how you could alert on a relative change of data. So I was referencing the previous talk um, from Steve at CDC again. They computed, they actually used, he talked to me a little bit afterwards, they used quite a complex model to compute that, that, base, that baseline, where they took the previous seven days, they ran it through some, some transformation algorithms, and they compute a nice, clean, this is what we expect our data to look like based on the history of the data. And so then you could, and you could alert on it based on taking the current data and comparing it to that. So this is an alert that can do that kind of thing. But let's, let's kind of go backwards through this alert for a second. So what we want to do is we want to alert now if the current data is somehow different to previous data, okay? So that means that we need to get current data and previous data together. So the way you get things together in capacitors, is you use the join function. The join function takes two edges of your graph and it joins them together and makes one edge. So basically, if you think of it as a table of data, it makes your table wider, and as opposed to longer. It adds columns to your table. And so you would take your previous data and you join it with your current data, but the capacitor function joins on time. So how do you get the old data and the current data to join when they're on different times? Simple answer to that is there's a shift function in capacitor and that allows you to take your old data and just shift all the timestamps for that data forward or backward in time. So the specific example um, online for that tick script selects some data from one measurement, selects some data from another measurement, and then it shifts the old data, and it says, well, first when it's selecting the old data, it runs a query, but it runs it with an offset of one hour, meaning that now is, what, three o'clock almost? And so it would say, okay, go get me the data from one to two, and then we get that that set of data. And then the query that's getting the current data would get the data from two to three. And you get these hours. And then it would take the data from one to two and it shifts it forward one hour. And then you get data that is now aligned in time, but you know that the meaning of the previous data is the previous data. You join them together, um, you compute a difference. So in this case, not using any complex models of like modeling the base time or anything like that, simply taking the difference. And if the, the difference is too large, um, aka, whoop, aka they changed too significantly, then you can trigger an alert. So that's how you can do an alert on a relative change, is take data, shift it in time, join it together, compute some compound metric from that um, difference. Um, some better things to use are um, uh, error, error, me error measures, like the mean absolute error, these kinds of things, where you would compute some kind of statistical behavior between the old ones and the new ones and put them together and then and then that way you'd have confidence that when something changed, that it's actually meaningful, you, meaningful to you as opposed to being just noise in your data. Okay, talking about a hot cache. So like I said before, the hot cache is kind of like a materialized view, if you're familiar with that concept in um, more relational databases. And in this architecture, capacitor is sitting wherever it wants to sit. Like if it's before the database, it's after the database, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's somewhere in your in infrastructure. But specifically this time, you're gonna have your client talk directly to capacitor to get the answer to a query as opposed to going to the database. So what this is, is the tick script goes and does whatever it is you need to do. The example I have just computes the mean of some measurement, um, nothing fancy. But then it puts it into what's called the HTTP out node or it caches that data 
so that you can then make an HTTP request to Capacitor and it will tell you the answer. So if you have a really expensive dashboard that when everybody on your team opens it up, it crashes the database, right? You could put the query for that dashboard as a tick script in Capacitor and then you could set it to hot cache and then to the HTTP out. And then what would happen is your clients can request that data from Capacitor and the data format that's returned is identical to as if you had queried it from InfluxDB. And then you can graph it on whatever graphing engine you have. Uh, Chronograph, Grafana, Custom, whatever, because it's the same format. And so that way, when everybody loads up the dashboard, all they do is they just get the most recent answer, right? And this way you only compute that really expensive whatever it was um, whenever it changes. So maybe you're computing, you know, maybe you have your dashboard set up to like an hour but on minute intervals, right? So then every minute it would recompute that value, but it would only do it once, period, and then everybody's dashboard would simply load in that data. So that's one way you can use capacitor, and that's a dashboarding example, but there's plenty of other use cases for the similar concept, right, where maybe, you know, the Tato group, right, it's, eh, you don't want to do this on the scale of months, so maybe this isn't a great example. I'm making it up on the fly here, obviously. But you could, they could pre-compute all of the monthly data and then have it as a hot cache, and they could use this as the Redis component of, of what they were talking about before. Not saying it's a great idea here because their scales are a little bit bigger than you'd want to hold in RAM in Capacitor, because remember, Capacitor does everything in RAM. That's kind of its forte. And so, um, but that's the idea, is you can cache the data so that you don't have to recompute it on every request. Okay, auto-scaling services. So this one's a little bit more complex than the ones we've talked about before, so, so um, we'll kind of walk through this one step by step. But the idea here is you want to take some service, right? You've got a microservice, it's your amazing microservice, and you need it to go scale up and down based on load. And you can, if you're using Kubernetes, or if you're using Docker Swarm, or AWS, these kinds of services, and there's others out there as well, you can, OpenShift is here, you can, um, you can simply set a number like, I want 10 of these servers, right? Or I want 100, and you can set that number up and down. But we're talking about setting that number automatically based on inputs and signals from the data sets you already have. So the way this would work is a really simple view of this, is you'd have the nodes in your microservice. So these nodes are not related to the tick stack, they're just doing their thing, they're a microservice. And they simply have a counter in them. And every time they get a request, they increment that counter. That's all they do. So they don't have much work to do in order to report their metrics. And so then, however you collect your metrics, you get those counters into Capacitor. Now that may be through Telegraph, through the database into Capacitor, that may be through Prometheus, directly to Capacitor, any number of ways, right? But somehow you get those counters per node into Capacitor. And the way, and so then Capacitor takes that data, and its job will be to determine how many nodes you need based on the request that you're receiving at this moment. And then it talks back out to the cluster manager, which in this case could either be Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, AWS. And then that, that manager will then go back to the nodes and either increase the number of nodes that you need or decrease and shut them down based on whatever capacitor decides. So the specific example that I have in the TickScript script um, goes through these steps to do this. And so first, it just simply gets the data you know, it, you know, capacitor tick script says from the data set that has my counters. Then it groups it by every node. So now you've got a group of data, point data for every node, and you take the derivative. Because those are simply counters, you need to know the rate of change. So we say, so after the derivative step, we now know the rate at which each one of these nodes is receiving requests. So let's make up a number. Let's say we have 10 nodes, and say that we have five requests per node. Okay, so obviously, <laughs> Really small numbers, but we're starting there. Makes it simple. So we get, so what we have now is a total of 10 times 5, 50 requests per second across the cluster. And we, let's say we, we want a target of 10 requests per node per second. So we've done some benchmarking and et cetera, et cetera. We know that our microservice can handle about 10 requests a second. So we put that as the target request per second into um, our tick script. Then we take that, we now know the requests per node, and we know we can sum those up, but now we know the total requests per second in the entire cluster. So in this case, we had 50. Then we divide by 10, because that's our target, 
and we get the number five, and we say five. We need five nodes. So then it capacitor would report via the auto scaling um, node there in the tick script to the cluster manager, I want five nodes for, for this service. And then since there were 10 nodes to begin with, it would start to shut down those nodes. And then instead of each node getting five requests, it's now back to the optimal 10 requests per node. Then a few minutes later, um, the requests go back up to 55, right? And it spins up one more node and this kind of thing. So the nice thing about this is it allows you to do your auto scaling based on metrics that are more directly related to the behavior of your microservice as opposed to the, the indirect signals like your CPU and memory usage. Most auto scaling systems allow you to do that already where they say, well, if my CPU is over 80% or if my memory hits this max or these kinds of things, because those are the measurements they have access to because they're the ones hosting the, the service, but they don't have necessarily ac uh, access to the application metrics. And so this is a nice way to kind of close the loop on that and be able to um, auto scale on concepts much more directly related to um, your, your application. Okay, so moving on. So forecasting, so we've talked about auto scaling. Now we're just kind of, sorry, changing gears completely, talking about time series forecasting. Yet another use case of capacitor. Um, we already heard one algorithm today, deep, R, deep RR, deep AR, and it, uh, it was uses a recurrent neural network to forecast a time series. We're not gonna talk about anything nearly as complicated as that today. We're gonna talk about Holt Winters, which is an algorithm from the 60s. Um, it's already built into Capacitor, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. So we'll talk about it, but, but first let me clarify what I mean by forecasting time series. Forecasting time series is based on one simple assumption, that past data is somehow related to future data. And that's it. So you simply say, I have a bunch of past data. I expect that past data to be similar in some way to my future data. And so you take past data and you predict what you think your future data would look like. So if this is um, traffic to your host, to your services, you know, you know, maybe you have Monday through Friday, you have a simple daily pattern and then the weekends are lower. And then it goes back up on Monday through Friday. And so you get these patterns in your data. And so you know, naturally, as humans, we can pick up on those patterns really easily and we say, okay, those patterns exist and we'd expect them to persist throughout, um, throughout the week on a week over week basis. So what you could do is you could take a month's worth of data so it sees four weeks of this pattern and then you could ask the algorithm to predict the next week of data. And then if it's a good algorithm, it will predict those patterns for you correctly. So the way you can do this in Capacitor is, like I talked about, there's an algorithm called Holt Winters, which is represented by this forecast block right here. So these, these blocks here represent the steps within the tick script itself. So just like in the alert on relative change, you would get historical data and current data and compare them, we're gonna do a similar thing here. Except the historical data we're gonna get is gonna be a much bigger chunk of data. And we're not just gonna shift that data in time forward, we're actually gonna do something to predict future data based on that historical data. So let's say we, so the example that we have in the, in the tick scripts and the repo is a disk usage uh, example. And I think this one's, this one's my favorite. So before I, so I have like half dozen Raspberry Pis at home and I have them automating various aspects of my life in my house. And then I have a, a home lab with several servers in them. So it's just me, but I have at least a dozen servers that I manage for all my own personal use. And that could get a little out of hand when it's just your hobby or whatever it is you're doing. So I don't want an alert, and yes, I get paged for my personal things, to come to my phone that says disk usage is high on Raspberry server or whatever for my 3D printer that's, I don't, I don't care. I'm not printing anything right now. I'll fix it later, right? So I want an intelligent alert on my disk usage. I don't want something that's just like a simple threshold because this can sit high, they can sit low, but if they're not changing, we don't care. So this, I actually use this, and it, it works quite well. I, I get, I don't know, an alert every like six months for my disks, and then I'm like, oh, I left something broken, and then I go fix it, and then it's done, and I don't have to worry about it. So the way it works is it gets the last um, 90 days of disk usage data from Telegraph running on those Raspberry Pis, and it, re it sends that to the Holt Winters forecasting algorithm. Holt Winters is a simple, very, very simple algorithm. It has, it has a, a recursive function, and it's just a mathematical expression that says, 
given a point in time and a bunch of parameters, what's the next point in time? And that's it. And so then with that next point in time, you can compute the next point in time. And that's all it is. But all those parameters allow it to emulate this behavior of like weekly cycles and growth rates over period, long periods of time or decline rates over long periods of time. And so what Whole Winters does is it just simply takes that 90 days of data and it just does a regression fit on those parameters for that simple recursive algorithm. Then it gets the best fit and then, it, then you tell it how many days in the future you want it to predict the data. And so I tell it seven days. So I get seven days of data into the future. And then um, I could compare that to the current value and say, okay, so my predicted value was this and my current value is this and they didn't match up, therefore trigger an alert. But current value doesn't really matter too much in the context of disk usage, especially when I'm predicting out seven days. I don't really care that my disk usage matches what I predicted. I just care if there's a predicted failure state in seven days. So this, so this slide's a little different from the one I have um, for the tick script that I'm using for my home. But uh, what it does is that when it gets here, it just says predicted seven days, and then it uses a simple threshold on that seven days. And I can set it to like 95%. Because it's not actually at 95% usage yet, it's somewhere where it's going to grow to 95% usage within the next seven days. So I have seven days to fix a problem before it actually happens. So when my 3D printer freaks out, I, I don't care. I swipe away the alert, and then when I feel like it in the next seven days, I'll go figure out why my Raspberry Pi is freaking out. And so, um, so forecasting. So that was very simple, very focused. How do I keep my home manageable with lots of servers? But the idea here is it's quite easy to forecast data for the future. And you can either forecast it and then check for, for failure states in the future, or you compare it against some expected current value. And you can do this either, you can kind of do this both ways. When you're training your model the first time, your loss function is going to incorporate the current values as feedback into that model. And the current values are, you take like your 90 days, but then you take the most recent month and you wouldn't use that when you're training. And you go, okay, did it accurately predict that month? Then after you're confident that your model is, is accurate, you let it run free and you would say, oh, do my current values match the predicted? So right now, I could predict that my usage for um, my service is at this percent in the next week. And if it doesn't reach that, something's wrong. Maybe I released something that made it difficult for users to access the site and my usage dropped, right? And so this can alert you to those changes that, that don't necessarily mean that something's, that you don't necessarily have other signals for that things are wrong other than the fact that something wasn't quite what you expected it to be based on historical patterns. So there's a lot of power to be had in, in forecasting data. So we've talked about six use cases and let's, let's kind of bring it all together. So flow-based programming. Again, it's this concept of a black box. In fact, one node has an edge, inputs and outputs, and it's a black box. But even a set of nodes is still a black box. It still has an input and it still has an output. So you can take any of the use cases that I just talked about, and you can combine them with another use case, and it still works. So for example, let's pick any two of the previous ones I've talked about. This is one's my favorite. Predictive auto-scaling. Why don't I predict my usage ahead of time and then auto scale, auto scale proactively based on simple usage patterns so that I'm ahead of my, my request curves instead of just simply reactive. Oh, I've got a big spike in traffic. Now I have to quickly spin up a bunch of servers, right? If you know that every Monday morning everybody comes in and checks your service for whatever reason, or monthly because you're, you're Tato, Tato and you've released the monthly report and you've sent an email to everyone and so you expect them all to come and look at your service, you could predictively auto scale for that load automatically ahead of time. So other ways, you could pre-process the data before you clean it or before, before you forecast. This is almost always necessary, right? You're gonna have to do some kind of data cleaning before you can just, just throw it at a forecaster. For example, on my Raspberry Pi example, I use the max value. I don't care about how it went through the whole day. I just care about the max value per day. So maybe it's like, creating files and deleting them or whatever, rotating logs. I just care about its peak because that's my failure mode. Um, learning on rel relative change from predicted value. We kind of talked about that one, with, again, with the forecasting. Um, you can alert on autoscale events. Maybe you're getting a ton of autoscale events because maybe you wrote your autoscale function wrong and it's, it's being too noisy, 
So you can tone that down. Or you can hot cache your auto scale metrics, right? So that, hey, what was the last thing? Like, why is my auto scaler behaving the way it is? Simply cache it. And then you can go and request it. And it's like, oh, OK, well, this is the input data it had. This is why it made its decision it had. And, and then you can also persist that data, et cetera, as you wish. So that's, that's my talk. And the takeaway is composable units. Capacitor has this flow based programming model where everything's a black box and you can just link things together. It has a wide variety of use cases to use it to help you solve the problems that you're running into, and you can link them together. And our vision for where Capacitor goes is to be able to make these things even more composable, which is where, with Flux, some of the changes we've made have been to make the code shareable, right? Tick scripts aren't like importable packages, right? But when Flux becomes that kind of an idea, that increases the shareability, the reusability of these black boxes or these modules for the kinds of things that you build up. So, hey, I've built my Raspberry Pi home detection thing. I can publish that as a package, and everybody can now just import it and reuse it for their own stuff, this kind of thing. So thank you very much. Next? Yeah, I'd love to do questions. Um, my question is um, about composability. Don't, don't you think uh, it would be better to have schema-full uh, uh, data? I mean, if I write down a, a query with capacitor and I don't know which, uh, which are the fields in the measurements, it could, it could be broken if something changes. Are you thinking of this or uh, it doesn't matter? <laughs> I mean. Yeah, so to make sure I understood the question. So the question is, how do you deal with schema changes in tick scripts? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so tick scripts can be written to be relatively schema agnostic sometimes. Right? So for example, in the auto scaling group uh, example, I had it talking about a node. But if you had tags on, you could write a script for every microservice that you have. Or you could write one script that groups by some service tag. And then it would apply to all of your services. And then there's other features of Capacitor that would allow you to pull in like different thresholds for each of the different services via, um, um, via that tag. And so if, if you take some time to, to think about it, it's often times that you, if you find yourself writing lots and lots of tick scripts for a similar thing, there's probably a way to rewrite that same tick script to be generic across your schema. But, but if your schema just straight up changes, like you don't have that tag anymore, then you need a new tick script. Um, because your data set changed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like there's a question right behind you, so if you want to. Um, hi. Uh, I have a question about uh, the post um, processing using Capacitor. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that um, uh, you can uh, export um, uh, data from in, uh, Influx TV into Capacitor, and then after uh, running the uh, post processing process, uh, import it back. So that sounds quite um, a lot of work. Uh, time-consuming work, so I was just to uh, wonder, uh, how does it uh, scale with the bigger data set? Okay, so is your question, so the question is, the, in the post-processing example where the data is flowing both into and out of capacitor back in the database, that's a lot of work. So is your question about the, the fact that there's a ton of data or the fact that data is moving? Because capacitor automatically, oh, okay, capacitor will automatically move the data for you. Like, you just simply write the query. Capacitor will run that query on a schedule. You don't have to manually do a data dump for Capacitor to get the data. It, can, it will go to the database automatically based on the settings in your task and grab that data and then write it back in. Um, as far as the data set, um, if it's really large, I mean, if your database can query it, then Capacitor can consume it. And so if it's too large of a data for you to, to be able to to be performant in querying the data back out of the database, I mean, Capacitor is just a client to the database like anything else. And, and then you have to match your write load appropriately as well. So we like to talk about Capacitor as not really being a shovel. It's not really designed to like move huge amounts of data. It's designed to be um, like find the needle in the haystack and, and move the needle, right? So it can shift through lots of data, but then when it's outputting that data, it wants to like make that a down sample or, or something important or some characteristic about your data. That's, that's a very high level way of thinking about it. Each use case is going to be specific. Okay, thank you. A couple questions up front here. 
Um, well, <coughs> um, thinking about the case of comparing your forecast with the current data, is it possible to, to just join um, the, a batch query data with the streaming data? Because in the examples, you more, uh, in most of the examples, you take a batch query and then uh, like every minute or every five minutes or something like that, not uh, like real time streaming. And is it possible to join the both types of data? And also, uh, is it uh, what's the difference in performance between doing a query every minute or streaming? Okay. So, question, Mark: Is it possible? Absolutely. Just tell me how. It's not possible, Mark. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's available in Flux. <laughs> That's the next answer. Okay. So, <laughs> so the next. So specifically, sorry, I had to do that, Mark. It just he set me up. I had to return the favor. Okay. So the question was. If you have stream and batch data, can you join them together and then do an operation on that? So the answer is no. Capacitors, a task is either a stream task or a batch task. They cannot be both. But if your task is a stream task and you want to join it with batch task data, batch is basically a superset of stream. And so you could rewrite the stream portion as a batch portion, and it would work. So almost always that's the simple answer there. So then the question of the performance in stream versus batch, I would almost always recommend batch. It's simpler to manage. It leaves most of the work, um, like it leaves the first layer of work in the database because it executes a query against the database as opposed to just getting the raw data. And so it has a couple advantages. Remember, capacitor will lose its state when it's shut down, so that includes all the stream state. But in a batch task, it knows its schedule, and so it can go back in time and re-request that old data and kind of resume state. And so it's a lot easier um, to, to resume your state with a batch task. And what that means is, uh, again, because capacitor doesn't store any state other than like the definition of your tasks, um, it uses InfluxDB as that storage. So then back to the, the Flux point. Um, in Flux, and we can talk a little bit more about this offline if you have a bunch of questions, but in Flux there won't be as much of a difference between stream and batch. We'll kind of figure that out behind the scenes for you. Um, because the only real difference is the latency. In, and so we'll figure out from the performance perspective um, which is the right way to, to do it, like as an actual subscription stream to the incoming data or as a batched query kind of thing. But since Flux has a lot um, lower level APIs to the underlying storage as compared to Capacitor that uses the query engine to get at the data, um, there's, it opens up a lot of possibilities to make that more performant. So, Thank you. So that's where Flux comes in. <laughs> a couple more questions. Right behind you, Carol. My question is uh, relevant to Capacitor being the client to InfluxDB. Now, if it is a client to InfluxDB and I want to consume Capacitor as a client, so I'm basically consuming the client with the client of uh, InfluxDB, it's like, how do I do that? Because normally you need to know the database to access the data. How can I access in, um, Capacitor as if it was a database? Is that possible? So are you asking if you can submit queries, like interact ad hoc queries to Capacitor and have them return the data? Yeah. It's not really. Okay. Um, Capacitor kind of has this task concept. And so if you want interactive queries, you kind of have to use InfluxQL, no, S I, I get SQL that. I get like that. that. I get that. What I meant was earlier, you mentioned that it can sit in front of um, InfluxDB as data have been coming, and then you can do some sort of processing and store it. Uh -huh. you know, that's possible. But you also, I, one of the diagrams you showed that you can also get cached data from yes. capacitor. You know? So the, the request is a different request, but the response is the same. Okay. So, so, so in the, the hot cache example where yes. the client's talking to capacitor, yes. the request it makes is a different request. It just simply just is an HTTP get with no parameters to a certain path uh -huh. for whatever path you set up in your tick script. Okay. But the response is the exact same format as if you had queried the database. Okay. So you have to do a little bit of work in whatever UI you're using to, to actually leverage that, but, it's, but not much, because it's just the, the request change. As opposed to submitting a query, you just hit make a get. Do we have time for more? One more? Yeah. One more? OK. Uh, <clears throat> I have a set of uh, data, with metadata for the metrics. OK. And I want to create a task that uh, uh, do several several things that metri metrics that come 
with this uh, metadata. What is the, the, the best approach for that? Okay, and to clarify, does this metadata change over time or is it relatively well, static? It, uh, relative st uh, static, for time, from time to time we adding Updated. and uh, changing, uh, we thought about putting it in a different uh, measurement as a set mm -hmm. of tags and the uh, fields that uh, define what to do with each uh, set. Okay. But how to... Yeah, so uh, capacitor has a function called side load. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to go and look up key value data from the file system. We haven't supported other key value stores yet. Simple like YAML or JSON files on the file system. And you look up that data based on tags on the incoming data. So for example, if there's an IoT use case, you've got a device ID. You only have to put the tag device ID on your data. It comes through. Capacitor could then look up the rest of the tag data that belongs to that device based on that tag as a key in that, in that file system. And then it, could, it would add those tags or fields, whichever you need, to your data stream. And then you could, for example, write that back to the database or just process that in Capacitor, however you wish. So the key word there is side load. That's the name of the function. So it meaning to, to add this tag to the, to the stream, not to, do the, to, not to keep the data as it is, as it was coming from the... The agent or whatever. From the agent. Yeah. So it'll, it'll add it to the stream of data that Capacitor has. Okay. And then if you want to persist that, just add after that step, ah, okay. add like an InfluxDB outline to send it back into the database. Or if you don't want to do that, just process it right there. So that, maybe we can talk a little more after, yeah. offline. But I think the answer should be yes, and the how is side load. <laughs> Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you. So it is possible. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Just how. Yes. Got it. Just, just clarifying, just I thought that's all I needed to remember. Um, now, Nathaniel, um, he didn't tell you this, he's available all weekend. Because, you know, <laughs> he is here with his wife, they might do something, but he'd be happy to answer capacity questions all weekend. But he will be here tomorrow for the workshops as well, so, so some more capacity questions I'm sure you will cover tomorrow. Yes. Um, uh, so, uh, how are we doing with heat? It's still hot, huh? Are we still working on it, Carol? Yeah? It's because it's sunny, apparently London and sun are just, uh, you yeah. know. I speak from someone who lived in Seattle, got the same problem.